Hi everyone, this is meteorologist Joel Curtis with your Alaska Weather TV show. Starting out with our hazardous weather, first of all we have a wind chill warning remains along the Arctic coast on into at least Thursday morning for temperatures minus 70 below in the wind chill. We also have a winter storm warning for the Bering, sea, sea, Bering Strait coast and St. Lawrence Island, that's until 6 a.m. on Friday whiteout conditions at times. We have a winter weather advisory for the central interior on Thursday. Uh, many areas are going to have snow, blowing snow, low wind chills. Also for the west coast, uh, eastern Brooks Range and southwest Alaska. A high wind warning for Skagway and the Klondike Highway and Juneau at least until 9 p.m. tonight and perhaps even longer. Also we have a wind advisory for all of the Alaska Range until 6 a.m. Friday. So looking at our satellite image, you can see a couple of systems developing, one uh, well south of Shimia, the other one uh, well south of Kodiak. Uh, the main low pressure system will eventually drift into the Bering Sea. For today's weather, we have a couple of weather systems that are showing up south of the Aleutians. Uh, 949 millibar low, that's, that uh, has been a very persistent feature for a number of days. Uh, well south of Shimia, and then we have a secondary low that's moving up, and that's south of Dutch Harbor, 974 millibars. A couple of fronts wrapped around that. Onshore flow for most of the western gulf, and that's uh, causing snow and snow showers all along the Alaska Peninsula, right on up into Cook Inlet, also for Prince William Sound area. And then as we get into the interior, we do have some areas of light snow, lots of blowing snow, and very, very low wind chills due to that strong Arctic high pressure system, 1,060 millibars, that's now in the Yukon Territory. For tonight's weather, we have those two systems again drifting around south of the Alaska Peninsula. But the uh, easternmost one, 968 millibars, is now starting to move into the Bering Sea. A couple of fronts wrapped around that, causing snow showers and lots of wind all across the Bering Sea, blowing snow all for southwest Alaska and on uh, up as you go into the west coast. Uh, lots of light snow all extending all the way up into the Central Brooks Range and also for the west side of Cook Inlet, Kodiak Island, and the eastern sides of the Kenai Peninsula, western Prince William Sound. Still very strong offshore outflow for the southeast panhandle, 1060 millibar high, now uh, moving over into British Columbia. And for Thursday's weather, that high persists over there with a still strong, strong offshore flow for southeast Alaska, also strong onshore flow for the western Gulf, as you can see with the snow. That low has moved now up into the Bering Sea, 970 millibars, snow and blowing snow all the way up the west coast, and then snow showers out over the Bering Sea. For Friday's weather, we can see a couple of weather systems now. Uh, the, the system's really splitting up. That 970 millibar low in the Aleutians is, is weakened quite a bit. Uh, still some onshore flow into the uh, Aleutians of the Alaska Peninsula or so. Also around that 989 millibar low uh, south of the central Gulf. It's still causing onshore flow in the western Gulf for snow and snow showers. And then, uh, of course, the west side of Cook Inlet and also a little bit into southwest Alaska and on all the way up the, the west coast uh, to Utiagovic. So our low temperatures Thursday morning. We're seeing single digits still for Skagway, 11 for Juneau, up to 15 for Ketchikan, 21 for Sitka, 12 for Yakutat. As we move further west, we see Gulkana minus 13, Valdez 15, 8 for Talkeetna, 16 for Anchorage, and 11 for Kenai, and then up to 26 for Homer, and then 32 for Kodiak Island. For the North Slope, 
Boy, oh boy, those minus 40 degree temperatures are still persisting with Dead Horse minus 46. That means with any wind, it's really, really very low wind chill down to minus 70 Fahrenheit or so. As you get further south, you see minus 20s, including uh, minus 22 for the Yukon Flats, also minus 4 for Fairbanks, uh, warming up a little bit as you get down to Norton Sound with minus 15 for Nome and minus 8 for the Yukon Delta, uh, minus 17 though still for St. Lawrence Island. As we go out the Alaska Peninsula, you see temperatures in the 30s, uh, 32 for the Pribilofs, but as still southwest Alaska is very, very cold with 25 around uh, for Bristol Bay, but single digits as you get up by Bethel and then uh, seven for Nunavak Island. And then for a high temperatures Thursday afternoon, we see uh, temperatures in the 20s for southeast Alaska and up to 30 for Yakutat, uh, 6 for Galkana, 29 for Valdez, 23 for, for uh, Talkeetna, 28 for Anchorage, 31 for Kenai, and then 38 for Homer, so nice above freezing there, and 40 for Kodiak Island. High temperatures Thursday afternoon have moderated quite a bit for the North Slope. So you see minus teens into the minus 20s or so. As you get further south, you see some even positive single digits, including a minus five at Fort Yukon, uh, a plus nine when you get down to Fairbanks, 17 in the Alaska Range because of the downslope winds there, six for Kotzebue, 16 for Nome, and then 26 for the Yukon Delta. And then for the, as we go out the Alaska Peninsula, note those temperatures in the 40s now that warm air has moved up with that weather surface system, 38 for the Privilofs, and then as you get into southwest Alaska, more like the lower 30s and 20s as you get uh, uh, further north. Our low temperatures Friday morning, we're seeing uh, single digits again for Skagway, 10 for Juneau, 16 for Ketchikan, 12 for Yakutat as you move over, minus 17 for Gulkana, 1 for Talkeetna, 13 for Anchorage, 25 for Homer, and 30 for Kodiak. And then you can see some minus 20s on Friday morning again, uh, all along the North Slope, minus 22 for Fort Yukon. And then as we work down, we see minus 8 for Fairbanks. But note the positive temperatures for the Alaska Range, again with downslope winds. Also looking for uh, 1 at Kotzebue, uh, minus 15 at Point Hope. 11 for Nome, and then as we get down to Yukon Delta, uh, plus 21. And then for our low temperatures Friday morning, as we move out the Alaska Peninsula, you can see that, that we've got uh, uh, temperatures in the 30s, 33 for the Privilofs, and then as we move up into southwestern Alaska, we see 29 for Dillingham, 31 for King Salmon, and then as we move up, 25 for Bethel, 28 for Nunavak Island. Uh, and, and then as dropping off as you get further north. For a high temperatures Friday afternoon, now we're seeing 19 at Skagway, 24 for Juneau, 29 for Ketchikan. It's going to seem like a heat wave there. 31 for, for Sitka, 33 for Yakutat, plus 3 for Golcana. And then as we get into South Central, 22 for Talkeetna, 25 for Anchorage, 29 for Kenai, 36 for Homer, and 39 for, for Kodiak. Along the North Slope, however, you can see that we're still in those single digits, minus 11 at Dead Horse, and then we get still minus 7 at Fort Yukon. And as we get down to Kotzebue Sound, plus 17 for Kotzebue, plus 26 for Nome, it's going to sound like a heat wave there too, plus 25 for St. Lawrence Island, 7 for, for Fairbanks, and 15 for as we get down toward the Akatat Range and, and uh, 16 for McGrath. And then as we go out for the southwest, you see temperatures in the 40s at, along the Alaska Peninsula dropping a little bit into the 30s as you go out the Aleutians, 38 for the Privilofs, 35 for uh, the southwest coast, including uh, Bristol Bay, and 31 for Bethel, and then uh, getting cooler again as you go farther north. Well, folks, that's it for our, our uh, public weather. Uh, please stay, pay attention to those uh, wind chill advisories and warnings that we have uh, going on, especially in the north, high wind warnings uh, for Juneau and the Skagway area. 
And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And now for your aviation forecast. Starting out with our flying conditions Thursday morning, we have IFR conditions over the Bering Sea up into the west coast of Alaska and Norton Sound and extending on up into the Brooks Range. Also the west side of Cook Inlet, Kodiak Island, and uh, lots of the Pacific side of the Alaska Peninsula. As we move on to Thursday afternoon, we see extensive IFR moving up the west coast into Kotzebue Sound uh, all along the west coast, uh, down to the Alaska Peninsula, including Unimak Island, uh, also uh, for Kodiak Island and extending well out into the Bering Sea. For Friday afternoon, the IFR has retreated somewhat offshore for the uh, west coast of Alaska, including uh, parts of Kostribu Sound, the western side of the Seward Peninsula, and Nunavak Island and the Pribilofs, and also for Kodiak Island and uh, some of the Alaska Peninsula. For Friday afternoon, we see uh, IFR has extended up into the Chukchi Sea, the west side of the Seward Peninsula, and much of the Bering Sea, central Aleutians, also the Alaska Peninsula, and Kodiak Island. For our pass conditions on Thursday, Anaktuvik Pass, IFR becoming VFR, Attigan Pass, marginal VR, VFR becoming VFR, and uh, turbulence for all the rest of the passes, including Lake Clark and Merrill for IFR, Rainy Pass, IFR with turbulence, Windy Pass, marginal uh, VFR and turbulence, Isabel Pass, VFR and turbulence, Mentassa Pass, VFR, turbulent, Tanita Pass, VFR, and turbulence. Portage Pass, VFR, turbulence. Chilkoot and White Pass, both VFR, and expect lots of turbulence. For our freezing levels Thursday morning, uh, most of the state, again, out below the surface, also offshore from uh, southeast Alaska. Uh, as we get out to the Alaska Peninsula, we see a, a, a two to 4,000 foot uh, freezing level. For our icing on Thursday, uh, much of the state has got uh, uh, isolated moderate uh, below 2,000 feet, and then as you get further south below 4,000 feet, we have uh, lots of areas of considerable moderate, both for the, uh, the east side of the Kenai Peninsula, Kodiak Island, also the Alaska Peninsula, and a little bit for the Bristol Bay area, all between 2,000 to 10,000 feet with isolated severe pockets in that. Also below 2,000 feet for the central Aleutians and below 8,000 feet for considerable moderate for the, eastern, for the western Aleutians. For a jet stream, uh, 80 knots southwesterlies of the north slope, but we see southeasterlies moving into the Bristol Bay area and the Alaska Peninsula, 105 knots. For 9,000 foot winds on Thursday, that uh, circulation around a secondary low in uh, near uh, Dutch Harbor, We've got uh, 85 knots southeasterlies over the Lake Iliamna area and also uh, into Bristol Bay, uh, 55 knots. Uh, 45 knots as you get over to the, the Kenai Peninsula, uh, 50 to 65 knots southeasterlies over, over uh, the Panhandle, and uh, southwesterlies 55 knots over the North Slope. We get to our 3,000 foot winds, we see 80 knots uh, southeasterlies over an extensive area of southwest Alaska, including Kodiak Island and parts of the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, we see uh, 40 to 55 knot easterlies coming off of the Panhandle, uh, 40 knots into Prince William Sound and over Cook Inlet, and some 40 to 50 knot areas over the central interior. For our turbulence on Thursday, We've got uh, extensive areas of considerable moderate all the way from uh, eastern uh, Norton Sound, uh, central interior, on down to the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak Island, and uh, all the way to Dutch Harbor. And there's areas of uh, isolated severe, especially along the Alaska Peninsula, all below 6,000 feet with low-level wind shear in that area, particularly in the southwest. Also, we have below 3,000 feet, considerable moderate for St. Lawrence Island, below 3,000 feet for the far western Aleutians, including a small area of isolated severe. And then for the entire Panhandle and uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, considerable moderate with uh, below 6,000 feet 
and also that you'll encounter uh, any turbines within 2,000 feet of any terrain in those areas. So fly safe, we've got a lot of turbulence and icing out there. Welcome to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service and joining us today, two more people to talk about the augmented reality sandbox. It's Alana Velaji. She's a University of Alaska Fairbanks mechanical engineering student, helped design and work on the details to make this new type of sandbox there. Thanks for joining us, Alana. <laughs> and Courtney Breest, she's the outreach coordinator for EPSCOR, which is the experimental program to stimulate mm -hmm. competitive research. It's a, a program funded nationally by the National Science Foundation, right? Yes. Okay. Alana, tell us about how you changed and adapted this version of the augmented reality sandbox. It's a really cool tool. So, Gina approached us with three goals for this new version of the sandbox. Mm -hmm. They wanted it to be compact mm -hmm. in a light system that could travel around the state. Mm -hmm. They wanted it to be child oriented. Okay. So we designed the sandbox to have three different levels. Okay. It's pretty cool. You can yeah. have younger children. You can have high school kids. Uh -huh. um, I guess I should say high school teenagers. Sure. <laughs> and then we also designed it to be more marketable, user friendly, so that this could be seen eventually in classrooms all over the place, all over the state. Okay, and you had a big hand in this, but this was a team approach, right? Definitely. It was a really good experience for myself, for George Stevens, who we'll see later. One of our hand models today. Yeah. For um, two other members who aren't here today, Cody Klingman and Austin Hunt. Uh -huh. And um, it was just a really good learning experience all around. Very good. And this is something that is part of your learning experience as well, so you get to check a box in your education. Yeah, right? it's a requirement for um, Seniors of Mechanical Engineering at uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Very good, very good. Well, it is a, is a wonderfully uh, inquisitive tool, fun to play with, and I hope to get my hands in the sand here in just a little bit. But it's also part of a bigger program, something that we were talking about a moment ago, EPSCOR, and that's what Courtney is here uh, to tell us more about. What is EPSCOR and why do you need a sandbox? Well, EPSCOR, as you mentioned, is a national uh, program. Mm -hmm. We're funded nationally, but we're actually located statewide. We're at UAF, we're mm -hmm. at UAA, we're in Southeast at UAS. And she mentioned, you know, taking the sandbox as an educational tool. And that's where our, I'm an outreach coordinator for the South Central Test Case. Okay. Our focus is on the Kenai watershed. Mm -hmm. And we are really interested in using these tools like the sandbox to interact with the students down there and get them interested in STEM and also communicate the research findings that we've been having throughout the state. Okay. And one of those, as uh, George and Eric are kind of changing the contours for us there from UAF to uh, maybe something that <laughs> resembles a little bit of something uh, more of the Kenai watershed, which is one of your focuses for the study, right? And, and specifically looking at some of the changes there and how that impacts people and also the salmon. Yes, it is a, all of our research is social mm -hmm. and environmental. Okay. So we have social scientists working hand in hand with our environmental scientists. One of the things we're studying is Upper Russian Lake mm -hmm. and we have a researcher taking sediment cores from that lake. So one of the things we're going to use the sandbox to communicate is how the landscape changed over a long period of time, thousands of years, going from glacier covered by glacier ice mm -hmm. to being filled with water. And, then and that's what they're doing right now. Exactly. So they're, <laughs> exactly. So so they're cool. moving the water around. And then I think they've got some props over there because we're also going to go a little bit more in depth and explain how the salmon got there. Okay. So using there's these. There's the salmon. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I think there's a few more. <laughs> yeah, we so. like more salmon in Alaska. More salmon. Yeah, exactly. So it's really taking the findings from our research grant and just trying to connect with the community and translate it in a really hands on and mm -hmm. exciting way so people can you know, interact with us as much as possible. Well, sure, that, that makes the learning and the science real and, and quite literally in your face rather than just some boring black and white paper that you have to read about. This is something that people can understand better because it's visual and they're touching and feeling and seeing these changes, right? Yeah, and get them engaged. And mm -hmm. then uh, outreach is a huge component and working with the younger students and actually even, I mean, working with the UAF graduate mm -hmm. and uh, engineering students is it's a huge part of our grant and our we really enjoy it. Oh, it is wonderfully exciting. And so, Alana, you were telling us that this is built to travel. Right. And this is built to do more things in version one. Where can this type of project go in Alaska? And what can it demonstrate? I mean, we were hoping to eventually get to 
villages that were harder to reach, mm -hmm. um, that you couldn't necessarily move a whole fixed instrument to, right? right. You need something that can pack up, fit in a truck bed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the, the most attractive parts of this project is that this was going to be something that was used past our, our graduation point. You know, this okay. is going to some, be something that lives in the state for years. Right. Right. Well, it looks like you're well on your way with that. So what are, uh, give me another example. What else can this show us? We've talked about the, the Kenai River watershed. What's the coolest thing that you've played in the sand with? What, what's your idea? Well, I definitely enjoy the props, but we also like kind of building up a giant mound. And uh, if you put some water behind it, you can make a, a little uh, runway, I guess, and, okay. you know, demonstrate the effects of the hydrology by just letting kind of putting up a dam and letting it all pour right down okay. and so that could I think you mentioned it earlier you could even demonstrate the effects of a tsunami right or okay. something along those lines so it's not just topography but it's also hydrology yes. and coastal surge mapping and some of the coastal changes that we're seeing here in Alaska and seeing what the smaller changes in the sandbox might do to kind of a real effect of a slosh or a push of water up on the coast mm -hmm. uh, tsunami inundation mapping or even glacial dam release as, as some uh, has been demonstrated before. Yep. So, oh, wow, that's you know that's just an impressive thing. That it seems like the possibilities are nearly endless with this, and probably even more ideas that are popping up in your head too. Yeah, as we speak. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, if folks want to get more information about EPSCOR, uh, you guys are online. You're on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. Uh, A K E P S C O R, right? EPSCOR, uh, Alaska EPSCOR, that is. Mm -hmm. And again, you guys are funded by the National Science Foundation, yes, so more to come from that and a, and a longer term study there. Thank you, ladies, uh, for joining us today. Uh, congratulations on your hard work there. This is really fun. And uh, for now, mm -hmm. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder uh, with this edition of Alaska Weather Facts, and I'm going to go play in the sandbox there. We'll see you next time. <laughs>
sees up to 26 feet in the Western Aleutians and up to uh, 20 feet on the Pacific side uh, south of ADAC. Then for Friday's marine forecast, we have southeasterlies coming around to northerlies as you get out in the Western Aleutians, wind speeds ranging from 30 to gale force 35 knots, and seas up to 19 feet on the Pacific side, up to 24 feet in the Western Aleutians. For the West Coast, northeasterlies and easterlies, 30 knots uh, over, over uh, Norton Sound, and then coming all the way up to storm force 50 knots as you get south of Nunavak Island, seas 16 feet there, seas 20 feet south of St. Matthew, and 45 knots easterly, seas 19 feet in the Privilofs. Heavy freezing spray should be emphasized in a lot of these near shore areas. Southeasterlies on Friday, up to 50 knots south of St. Matthew Island, seas up to 20 feet, and uh, ranging down to 30 knots in Norton Sound. For the Arctic coast, winds around 10 knots. That's really backed off a whole lot, which should lay off on the wind chill too. But as you get down from uh, Cape Lisburn all the way down to the Bering Strait, winds increasing from 15 to 40 knots. And then Friday's marine forecast, 5 to 10 knots along the north slope. But as you get into the Chuck Sea Sea, the winds start ramping up 20 up to 30 and then down by the Bering Strait, 45 knots. So for tonight's weather, we've got a low 968 millibars moving into the Bering Sea uh, west of Unalaska Island. We also see snow showers all over the Bering Sea, onshore flow in the western gulf, and offshore flow in the eastern gulf, especially in the Panhandle area. Then for Thursday's uh, weather, we see the 970 millibar low has moved into the Bering Sea, Lots of offshore flow, blowing snow along the west coast or so. Also, onshore flow for the western gulf, especially Kodiak Island and Kennedy Entrance. And then offshore flow, all those bays and channels, from a 1054 millibar Arctic high pressure system. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.